Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where today we're going to do a lightning fast video. And it's going to be fast for two reasons. One, because I don't have much time. And two, because we're talking about Dedrick's SQL Serverless. Now, this is currently out in private preview, and as with many things inside Dedrick, it's a gated private preview. So you need to ask your account exec, you need to ask Databricks themselves, can you please turn on for my workspace in this subscription? Uh, and then you'll be able to go and have a play with things. But yeah, what is it? So serverless is obviously a big thing. We keep hearing about various different serverless architectures and serverless services. And we've obviously got Synapse serverless as one of the main ways we query things um, in a lake house architecture in Azure. So Databricks SQL serverless is the new kid on the block. It's the new service trying to do the same kind of thing, but differently. So we're going to have a quick look at what it is, how it works, how you enable it, how long it takes to start, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, if it's your first time around here, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and let us know down in the comments how you get on with it. Are you using it already? Have you plumbed it in? How good is it? Do you love it? Really, really good to hear about how people are getting on. But then, yeah, let's just go have a look. So I think We'll talk about how it works and how it fits and all that kind of stuff. But I think everyone just wants to know what it looks like and how quick it is and all that stuff. So let's let's do that first. So I'm over in Databricks SQL. So number one, this is currently just for the Databricks SQL side of things. So if you've got some clusters in your data science and engineering, you're doing a lot of data engineering, you're turning on traditional uh, Spark clusters, this does not affect any of that. Your existing Spark clusters work in the same way they always have. It's just when we're on the SQL side of the fence. And it's when these things that they've rebranded as SQL warehouses, and I hate that they're called warehouses because the whole point of a warehouse, that a lake house is that it's not a warehouse, but we're now calling them warehouses. Anyway, these SQL warehouses, they're just Spark clusters, right? So we can say I can create a SQL warehouse and this is going to build a Spark cluster and it's going to get upset with me that I've got too many things. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I don't want an extra large one. Who wants an extra large one? That's fine. But this is... A traditional Spark cluster. So the way normal Spark works is I turn on my cluster, I wait for five minutes, my cluster comes up, and then I can use my cluster as much as I want. And that's not good enough if I've got some dashboards and things behind it. So we're going to turn on Databricks SQL Serverless. To do that, I need to nip over to the SQL Admin Console. Again, different admin console than your one if you're on the Data Science and Engineering workspace. You need to be in Databricks SQL. Go into the SQL Admin Console. And then there's some things we can do. We've got SQL warehouse settings. And then up here, we've got that magical button. Now, if you're not enabled for the preview, you will not see this option. That's only there because I've had it ticked on so we can come and have a play with this. So I can come and say, yes, please. I would like to make it serverless SQL warehouses. Going to hit save down here. Successfully saved. I've enabled serverless SQL warehouses. I appreciate no one can actually see that. Let me just fix that so people can actually see my screen. That always helps. Um, there we go. Okay, yeah, so there's just a little save button down there that I've saved and applied those changes. Uh, and then now if we go back to SQL Warehouses and I go, I want to create a SQL Warehouse. You can see in my advanced options, I've now got, yes, this is going to be serverless. So I've enabled the ability to have a serverless SQL endpoint. But, sorry, SQL Warehouse. Um, you'll notice everything else is still the same. So my options are still the same. I still have to pick how big a Spark cluster do I want. I still have to decide how long it stays on before it turns off. I still have the ability to scale up and down. So what we are not doing, we're not doing a switch to a paper query, paper read style of pricing. That is not how Databricks SQL Serverless works. What it is is just saying you can have the, not the same cluster that you normally have, the same uptime you might normally have, but it starts within a few seconds. And then it'll turn off after, in this case, 10 minutes. So you still build for the cluster. You still build for having that compute stood up. Uh, the second, third, fourth, tenth query that comes on within that you know initial, as long as you haven't waited 10 minutes, they're just going to hit an active Spark cluster. So all we're doing is just changing how long it takes to turn it on and therefore how what percentage of the day we need to have this thing turned on at all. I'm going to call this my no servers here cluster. They're still servers. They're still a cluster. It's just serverless for me, for my subscription. Um... And there we go. So I've got this no servers here. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop it starting. Oh, spoilers. So we can see it's sat here. The cluster size is small. That's all good. And if we switch over to the SQL editor, I've just got a, a quick query over a delta table. Uh, just doing a quick group by. In fact, we make, let's make it even easier. Let's give it a real easy shot and just do a select star. 
Give me a select star from this table. Table sitting in kind of uh, a quick bit of sample data that I did. The server is currently turned off. So this is like a query coming in from Tableau, coming in from Power BI. So I'm just going in right. I want to start working with it. So we should see that this cluster thing actually going to start. And I've got a little tick against it to show it's running. Uh, and then it actually will run the query. So yeah, from naught to actually running, we're talking about a couple of seconds. There you go, 10 seconds runtime to do a select star from a table with no cluster turned on. And now a cluster. But now that cluster is now turned on and I'm paying for those machines. So I'm paying for that 2x small uh, Databricks SQL cluster, the same as I would be had I just started it and waited five minutes. And that's going to sit there and I'm still paying for it. Now I get caching and all that kind of good stuff. So I can then kind of query that table and now it's nine milliseconds to go and actually run on top of that query because that thing's already turned on. And that's it. I told you it was a quick video. <laughs> so in terms of how Databricks SQL Service works, it is just the same Spark cluster that turns on really, really, really quickly. And then you can work with it as normal. So I'm currently still being billed for it. It's not uh, not billing me per query, per runtime. It's not billing me per data read, any of that kind of stuff. It is just a Spark cluster that turns on very, very, very quickly. You can see in my query history, I can see that the actual runtime of these things is nice and quick. Um, making it run. So kind of dig in. We can see what happened. We can see generally kind of the what was actually sort of spent the time on. You get all the same stuff you'd normally do in Databricks SQL. It is just a Databricks SQL cluster. The difference being it turns on really, 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 really quick. So just to show behind the scenes what I was actually doing there, all I've done is I've taken that kind of uh, as part of the Databricks data sets. There's that 10 million people parquet. I'd grab that. I'd bring it down as Delta. And I'd expose that as that table. So it's just a Delta table. Just kind of got 10 million rows across four files, I think it is. Which is really small for uh, <laughs> files. And I'm just running a select star. There's nothing crazy in terms of what we're doing. But we're just trying to trying to challenge it. Trying to say how quickly does it run? How well does it run? All of that kind of stuff. And yeah, pretty quick. So if you're looking at that and going, oh my god. Oh my god, that's amazing. We need to start using it. Uh, the only thing you need to know is just the, the slight nuance in terms of what that what's happening with that compute. I mean, if you switch over, there's a, the whole blog post, all the documentation's live. You can go and have a look at how it all works. She tells you a bit of blurb about kind of what it is and kind of uh, the fact it's serverless and how it prices and things. The main difference is, as it's kind of saying up here, uh, for your classic data plane, aka your norm, a normal Spark thing, a non-serverless, um, all the VMs, so a Spark cluster is just a bunch of VMs. Those VMs get created inside your own as your uh, as your um, subscription. If we're saying in serverless, there's actually a, a linked Databricks subscription. So it's not inside your Azure subscription. It's in, inside the Databricks subscription. And that's where those machines again live. Now that is a shared tenant with other uh, clients. Uh, it's all fully networked in. You, know, you can't run queries on each other's data or anything like that. But you are having to trust that that is managed outside of your own control. Uh, now, currently, that's also running outside of your networks. So if you want to be able to start doing full, you know, you can't do VNet injection with it yet. You can't do plumbing into secure architecture. So currently, if you're just using Databricks and it's kind of fairly standard open access using Active Directory to manage uh, security, then absolutely you can do this and this will work. And it's, again, 10 second startup time currently for the um, that Databricks SQL cluster is great. Really, really fast. Um, Again, hoping in the future we'll start seeing those elements, the proper VNetting, being able to inject these things into a VNet or at least do a managed kind of um, VNet peering, all that kind of stuff. But again, it's in preview for the first release. So this is just straight running on the, the public side of things. And yeah, be aware of that. It'll still run in the same region. So you shouldn't have data regress costs. You shouldn't have anything like that. It should still be sat in the same region. Um, so if you have multiple different Databricks workspaces and you've got servers turned on, they'll be running in different regions, whatever region your Databricks workspace is in. Uh, but yeah, you can go and have a look at it. And there's some details about what you can and can't do currently with networking and all that kind of stuff. But that's mainly just context to kind of so before you start using it. Um, generally, if you're doing things like using Power BI with like direct query and that kind of stuff, which you shouldn't be using pure direct query against it, you should be using a mix of aggregations, competent models, etc. But if you are occasionally having things go back to the source and previously you've had to have a spark cluster sat there all day 
just so it's ready for any time anyone asks questions. This is essentially saying, well, just shut it down if no one's answered a, asked a question for 10 minutes. And then next time someone asks, they get a 10 second penalty in their query time. And that's not that bad. Compared to a five minute penalty, that was like, no, we can't do that. We're going to have to leave it turned on all day. 10 second penalty for the first person to run a query that's where nothing's been ran for half an hour. Yeah, it's pretty good. I'll quite happily do that to save a ton of money. I think there's various different stats I think we've seen around, but I think they generally talk about at least a 40% saving on your day to day costs because you get that much time of your spark cluster not being turned on, which obviously saves you a ton of money. And yeah, that's it really. As I said, super short little video. It's just simple. If you've got Databricks SQL Serverless, the preview, when it's announced in GA, it's a case of turning it on at the Databricks SQL admin level, switching your cluster over to be a serverless cluster. And then, yeah, it'll suddenly be really, really, really quick to turn it on. The only limitation is if you are currently using a heavily secured uh, Databricks ecosystem, if you've got your, your Lake and Key Vault and your Databricks uh, workspace all behind uh, your own managed um, virtual network, you're not going to be able to plug it in just yet. So, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know if you've got any questions about it. Let me know if there's any use cases you're looking and you're trying to figure out how you'd want that to work. Um, note that you can have multiple different serverless clusters. So, unlike Microsoft's um, Synapse Serverless, which doesn't have an idea of scaling, doesn't have an idea of that, but it does have one single pot of money you're spending from, now we can go, well, actually, I've got different ones. You guys can get a really, really big scalable one. You guys can have a little small tester one. You can manage that kind of thing. And it's, yeah, it's interesting differences in the approach cool well on that note i'll leave you to it and uh, yeah see you next time cheers